How's it going, guys? Um, first of all, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, I am honored to, to speak on behalf of the Contemporary uh, Series in Philosophy and Religion. Uh, I know it's the last week of classes, and so I'm appreciative of you guys donating your time and coming to check out what I have to say. So, I don't know if anybody had a chance to read the, um, the flyer, but the title of my presentation is Merleau-Ponty and the, as I say here, Merleau-Ponty and the expression or expressivity of existence, which is essentially what it is. I've kind of tweaked the title since I first donated it. But we're going for ultimately his notion of style. Now, I know style means a lot of different things, maybe to a lot of different people. For Merleau-Ponty, it's, uh, it's an ontological notion. It's something that cuts right to the core of who we are as people. But of course, it's not unrelated to notions of style in the aesthetics realm, in the realm of just sheer mannerisms. So we're going to take a look at all of these things. So up there you have Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Now, as you see, he is a 20th century thinker born in 1908 and died uh, rather untimely, actually 55 years ago yesterday. So it's, it's somewhat interesting that uh, I'm here to talk about him. Um, you see him on the right there in his, uh, in his older age, so to speak, lighting a cigarette, as these French philosophers are wont to do. And then on the, uh, on the other side there, you see him pictured with uh, another famous philosopher, a contemporary of his, Simone de Beauvoir. So that's what they are, they're looking about understanding the human condition. Okay, so I'm gonna provide a little bit of context first, just out of which Merleau-Ponty is responding with his philosophy, and then we're gonna delve much deeper into his notion of style. So an ontology of expressivity, what does that mean? Well, first it's important to understand exactly to whom he's responding. So he's critical of the two major movements in philosophy at the time, and this is again the, uh, the early 1900s both of which are, as he describes them, secondary abstractions from cohesive concrete experience. So the two major movements here are empiricism and what he refers to as intellectualism, but I think is better, better known as rationalism or idealism. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people have ever heard of those isms? Empiricism, a couple of people, okay. Feel like you know what that means? All right, all right, it's a decent amount of hands. Uh, does somebody want to tell me what that means? Yeah, please. Well, basically, in theory, that means that you have to learn through knowledge to yourself. Hey, good, very good. All right, so essentially, it's as I have it here. Um, and again, this is a very cursory definition of these two, basically how it responds or how it pertains to what Merleau-Ponty is saying. So empiricism, the world imprints itself upon us and to a large extent determines us. So essentially, we're a tabula rasa kind of thing. And the world... I suppose you could say, activates our senses from without. Then there's intellectualism, again, as he refers to it. One's experience is more private and internal, knowing only representations of what lies beyond our individual consciousness. So on the one hand, these are two extremes from Merleau-Ponty. On the one hand, you have empiricism, which is kind of the source of all the content of who we are, especially relative to notions of style and personal identity. So things imprint upon us. On the other side, you have a, a kind of really privatized understanding of what reality or existence is, where what we know for sure, for certain, is that we have an intellect. We have what's called a, a cogito. And how certain we are of what exists outside of that is precisely what's up for debate. In either case, Merleau-Ponty is concerned that it's too abstract, that essentially we arrive at these particular isms, we arrive at these theories of reality in an artificial way, in a way that first and foremost has to, again, cut almost surgically or abstract from what he considers to be very cohesive, very full and rich, concrete experience, existential experience. He's often referred to as an existential, although kind of a qualified one. So what he, he poses here is a different thing, an ontology of expressivity, which is to say oneself and one's experience in the world of indelibly intertwined experience is. Collapses the subject and object dichotomy to where all subjectivity is intersubjectivity. A lot, of, a lot of big words there. Essentially what he's saying is this, that in order to 
have any concept of self, of who we are, we must first and foremost admit or just allow ourselves the freedom to be engaged in the world with us in such a way where reality itself and who we are are co-constituting, that they emerge simultaneously as one. So it's not as if there's an objective reality out there and we as subjects try to get at it in our own particular way. It's in fact what he would call a, a misnomer, an abstraction to say that there's such a thing as a subject over and against an object and vice versa. That in fact there is no such thing as objectivity versus subjectivity. They arise together in, in a very symbiotic kind of way. So, that's kind of a, a very brief overview of, of his understanding of things. Now we're going to look at how style plays a role in this. So, again, the title of my initial paper had to do with nature, had to do with embodiment, and it had to do with language. So I'm still going to run down that, but in each of these cases, we're going to see that style functions as a mode of expression. And that, that expression, that mode of expression, is in fact our very being is in fact who we are, what we are, how we are. So let's take a look. And of course, it, it, I know we have a Q&A session at the end, but at any point, if anybody wants to comment or has a question, please feel free to throw a hand in the air. It's totally acceptable. Okay, all experience is expressive. So here's a quote that I think gets at this notion of his disdain for what you might call rationalism or any sort of internalism. So he says, if I try to study love or hate purely from inner observation, I will find very little to describe. A few pangs, a few heart throbs, in short, trite agitations, which do not reveal the essence of love or hate. We must reject the prejudice which makes inner realities out of love, hate, or anger, leaving them accessible to one single witness, the person who feels them. Rather, anger, shame, hate, and love are not psychic facts hidden at the bottom of another's consciousness. They are types of behavior or styles of conduct which are visible from the outside. That's from a work of his called Sense and Nonsense. Now, this notion of visibility and visibility is very crucial. It ties back to the point we just made about everything being cohesive, everything cohering as, as one in some unified yet flexible way that the nature of our being, both individually and collectively, is this give and take, this to and fro between our private perspective, so to speak, and then that which formed it, which is to say outside experience. So again, the, the ultimate point here is simply that, as he says, love, hate, anger, it's not something that we kind of get at internally on the inside, like our private emotions. It has to do with the way the world interacts with us. So when we feel love or in love, or we feel the love, however you want to put it, it's because the world, and, and this is in a, in a real sense he means this, the world is loving you back. Or the world is angry at you and you are angry. Again, that, that's how deep it goes. That's what we mean by this kind of symbiosis. Okay. Now let's get to the modes of style. Now, once again, it's nature, it's embodiment, and of course, it's language. Um, I'm going to highlight the paradoxical aspect of this, again, as my title indicates. However, I really want to keep in mind the fact that all of these, despite their paradoxical natures, are still modes of expression. It's still expressivity. So, we're building from the ground up here. One style is spontaneous. One expresses oneself naturally or spontaneously, rather than calculatingly. So the paradox involves how we can cultivate a style that is already innate and thus characterizes us. So, so here's, the, here's, the, here's the deal, so to speak. Um, he contends that we all have our own individual or unique style. Now this style is, at least on this ground level, and, something that we aren't fully aware of and something that we didn't necessarily choose to have. And what's more, this style is expressed by us, through us, constantly, in several ways, basically in every way possible, at all times. Um, I mean, it's funny, I mean, I, I, look, I look around the room right now and I see people sitting in different ways. Some are slouching, some are sitting up straight, some have their arms folded. That's part of your style. 
Did you sit down and say to yourself, okay, I'm going to sit down like this, and then I'm going to fold my right arm over my left arm, and then I'm going to lean a little bit on my, on my left cheek, and then I'm going to look like this. You didn't make any of those decisions. Those weren't calculated decisions or choices. It's just, you just sat down as you do, as you would. So as you're sitting right now, is your style of sitting during a public lecture, the last week of classes? We all do it differently, but we all do it in some way. And when I say nature, I mean it's what comes naturally. It's, it's organic. You don't have to contrive it in any sense. It's your style. Now, of course, the question becomes, where did one acquire one's style? And again, this, this, just to be clear, this doesn't necessarily remain with regards to how we sit. It's everything. It's how we look when we're seeing things. It's how our, our very person expresses itself, interacts with the world around us, even in the everyday common experiences. Well, it has to do to some extent with our natural capacities. So, I have a book right here. This is, probably, this is probably his most major work. Um, it's called The Phenomenology of Perception. And what we mean by this here is sensory perception. So by nature, you have senses. This is how you take in the world to some extent. Now, if it sounds empirical, after we just spoke about how he has some sort of disdain for empiricism, um, he's willing to take it up. He's willing to see the virtues of both of those isms and then synthesize them into his own. This is where the natural notion of style comes from. You have a certain body, you have certain organs, an, an organ system. And depending on how they are, depending on how healthy they are, depending on how they develop, how, how they don't develop, it's going to impact the way you perceive the world. And therefore, it's going to impact the way you comport yourself to the world. Um, even on a very basic level, if you didn't get a lot of sleep last night, then you're not going to be so attentive. You're not going to be sitting upright. Your style is to slouch a little bit. That's what's natural. Even if you're trying to work against it, that's what happens. And so I have over here genetic inheritance as well as the beginning of natural habits that develop without our consciously choosing them. I don't know if anyone is familiar with psychology at all, but this idea of acquiring habits at a very young age so if you ever have looked at pictures of yourself when you were younger, watched videos of yourself when you were a child, you might recognize that maybe the way you walked as a three-year-old, a four-year-old, the certain looks you would give to people are still the looks today you give to people. It's still the way you walk today. And again, it's not as though you chose to, to approach things in this way. It's not as though you tried to make yourself a certain way. You just are that naturally. By virtue of, again, maybe certain genetics, as well as other, other aspects that we'll be looking at shortly. And again, just to be clear, the paradox is how we can cultivate a style that is already innate. Now, I think when most people think of style, they think of cultivating a style. They think of, okay, I want to be stylish, or I want to understand what style is, and so I'm going to, I'm going to analyze it. I'm going to try to imitate it. Maybe it's a style of painting, and you want to be a painter, style of music, or maybe it's just fashion. Something like that. And so you, it seems as though we intentionally focus on cultivating certain styles. And while, you know, that is true, as we're going to see a little while, in a little while, it's not necessarily the, the entirety of what style is. That just by virtue of being alive, you have a style already that's uniquely your own. And the kicker, of course, is that other people see it, even if you don't. And sometimes they'll tell you what your style is. Okay, so there's more I can say on that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pushing here. Okay. Embodiment, perhaps the most essential of all of these concepts here. So his notion of embodiment is the grounding for what he understands style to be. So first, let's take a look here. He says, whether a system of motor or perceptual powers, our body is not an object for an I think. It is a grouping of lived through meanings which moves towards its equilibrium. So again, what might that mean necessarily? Well, on the one level, he's talking about, again, this notion of instinct or instinctual embodiment, pre-conscious, pre-reflective embodiment, to the point where every time, again, you make a decision, you do something, it's not necessarily fully thought out. Sometimes it's just reactionary. It's whatever comes natural. And this shows itself most often in the body. Now again, 
I, I used the term bodily comportment before. That simply means just how you comport your body, how you move, the way you gesture, the way you show expression. All of these things are relevant. They all come to bear on this notion of embodiment. So it's not really just you have a body in the sense that your soul has a body or something like that. Your body is some sort of instrument, some sort of tool for the mind. It's, it's much more intimate than that. But for Merleau-Ponty, your body is what you are. That you experience all of existence through your body. And things resonate in a bodily way, in a sensory percept perceptible kind of way. And this is why style becomes so important for him. It's because if our unique, our absolutely individual unique style shows itself most fully through our body, and our body is how we understand all of existence, how we get at existence, get at experience, well then our style is existence. Our style is lived experience. And pushing it a little bit further, and we're going to do so in greater detail later, one's style is one's world. It is, it is the world from Merleau-Ponty. And so he continues, the lived body is not just an array of parts and functions, but a synergetic unity of carnal intentional mappings. Now again, that sounds rather verbose. Essentially, he's talking about the way in which a body operates is something that does not need constant directions or directives. I mean, you don't have to tell your heart to keep beating. You don't have to tell your intestines to digest the food. Things like that. Similarly, if somebody surprises you, you don't tell your eyes to perk up. It happens again naturally. It happens by virtue of your bodily experience. And what's more, getting back to that notion of expressivity, we come to communicate with the world, interact with the world cohesively, holistically, through the body. So that our body is basically our medium for expression. And therein, lies our style. Different people respond to stimuli differently. And that's how you begin to learn both of others and of yourself what your unique style is. At least your initially inherited innate style. And then from there, as we're going to see, we can begin to cultivate certain stylistic qualities. So again, keeping an eye on the paradoxes here. The first one, again, the paradox seemed to be if style is something inherited, something innate, something that we are kind of born with and we develop as children before we can actually have a mind of our own to decide whether we like our style or not, well then how can one cultivate it? This is another paradox. One style manifests, again, in a pre-reflective manner. When paying attention to it as an object of reflection, what once flowed organically becomes abstracted from the context and as such may, may become elusive or forced. So what does that mean? The natural, organic quality of one's style can sometimes be lost when we focus on it too much. Um, and I think this exhibits itself in a number of ways. Um, I don't know, for example, you might be in your mid-20s, I don't know, and you've been walking for a very long time, and you're comfortable with walking, you have a certain kind of gait, a certain kind of walk. You don't really think about it, you just get up and walk. But then if somebody you have a crush on is watching you and you realize they're watching you, suddenly you're going to pay attention to your walk. Suddenly you're going to, you're going to make it a, a focal point. And then what might happen? Walking suddenly doesn't become so easy or natural because you're paying too close attention to it. And you're maybe trying to, to exhibit certain qualities in your walk that you know are there and you're trying to exaggerate them and suddenly you lose them. They're elusive. And you feel, you feel under the microscope. That's interesting. So on the one hand, you can never really lose your style. It is who you are. But on the other hand, it seems like there are several moments when we forget our style, where we can't seem to apprehend it in a natural, organic way. You know, I always think, I, whenever, whenever I read this over, this particular passage in, in Merle Ponce, I, I think of a particular situation. It, it, it is baseball season. Is anybody a baseball fan? Four people out of like seven, okay. Is anybody a baseball fan from the late 90s? All right, this is going to go over great. Okay, so there was, a, there was a baseball player named Chuck Knobloch. 
I'll just make this really quick, but because I, I can't help but think of it even right now. There's a ball player named Chuck Knobloch. He played second base. He won a lot of what are called gold gloves. It means he was really excellent defensively. Um, he was especially good at throwing, especially from behind second base, a long throw. You'd have to be very athletic to do this. But he had his own style. His throw was very unorthodox, very strange, not the kind of way you would teach mechanics to somebody in t-ball. And one day, one of his coaches pointed this out. He said, you know, you know, Chuck, you really have a funny way of throwing. Like, it's, it's really unusual. It's really your way of throwing. And he said, and this is all, all recounted in an interview, he said, you know, I never, really, I never really thought about it like that. So he went and he watched some tapes of himself, and he paid attention to how he threw the ball. And then from that day forward, he couldn't throw the ball at the first base ever again. Every time he tried to do it, he, he, he just he, he couldn't do it. It was, too, it was too abstracted from his everyday concrete experience. He made it an object of reflection, his very style. And then he couldn't replicate it anymore. To the point where they had to move him to left field, and then they cut him. I mean, I can't, I, you know, he played for the Yankees, I'm a big Yankees fan. And, and I can't tell you how many times, just a ground ball to second base, and he would just chuck it into the stands. And this was a man who was amazing at second base. Because the moment he began to critically reflect on his style, it no longer became natural, no longer became organic. He tried to cultivate a different style. He tried to go back to basics, to fundamentals. Maybe I'll just try throwing like everybody else throws. Still couldn't do it. Sad story. Okay, so that might be an example of, of the paradox here. This, this oddness of trying to make oneself, make one's style an object of reflection and thereby distancing oneself from who one is, from, from the way one is. Keeping on the theme of baseball, uh, if you know anything about baseball, you know there are batting stances. There are several different kinds of batting stances. For every player, there's a batting stance. And here are some particularly weird ones. You've got Gary Sheffield, you've got, looks like Pujols, and you've got that guy Craig Council, looking like he's, I don't know, trying to catch lightning with a golf club. So here's what you have, different kinds of styles. It's interesting because in each of these batting stances, it began as something natural, as a young child just picking up the bat. And then over time, they've tried to cultivate certain stances that work for them, that play to their particular natural style, their genetics, their strengths, their, their, um, their weaknesses, trying to overcome them. And they try to hone their style over time. So again, there's no one right way to swing a bat because there are several different kinds of hitters, several different styles of hitting. And on the one hand, with baseball players, this is their business. They get paid millions of dollars. So they do tend to focus on this. But of course, the point being, it began as something that didn't require much focus. And, and this illustrates the point even more. This is one guy whose batting stance developed over time. His style changed due to his experiences. He was able to cultivate a more refined batting stance. And so you call that his batting stance. That's the, what's this guy's name? Dombrowski? Uh, I don't think he had a prestigious career. This is Dombrowski. That's Dombrowski's batting stance. You could recognize it. And that's kind of the key to style, I suppose, in general, relative to the body. You can recognize people based upon their gestures, based upon how they interact with one another, with people. They have an indelible style. Okay, pushing right along. Let's get to language. Language is, I guess, the last part here. And then we're going to put all these pieces together at the end. I have culture in parentheses there. Because on top of nature, on top of just what you're genetically given, on top of all of that stuff, on top of your attempt to cultivate, you have culture's influence on your style and culture's influence on style in general. So of course, we understand that in various ages, historical ages, just decades in the, in the 20th century, there's been different kinds of styles in fashion and music, all this stuff, relative to a particular time, a particular place, geographically, things like that. We can focus on a number of various things, but if you focus on language, I think that's the most rewarding. And so it says here, Merleau-Ponty wants to make a distinction. He wants to reduce language down to two forms of language, spoken language and speaking language. So spoken language, language after the fact, or language as an institution which effaces itself in order to yield the meaning it conveys. 
So that's just languages we understand. It. That's languages, those are languages that have been established over time, the English language, um, the French language, any kind of language that has been well established to the point where it's like an institution. This is important for Merleau-Ponty because to a certain extent that is going to bring you into the world with a very particular access point to it. He believes that language is an access point into how, into what the world is for you. So for example, there are some languages, the German language, that lacks certain terms, that seems to lack certain nuances that maybe other languages like the Romance languages have. And so if you're raised in, say, a Romance language, the way you articulate the world around you linguistically with your words conveys a certain understanding of how the world is for you. And that in turn informs your style. That's the institution, that's the culture part of it. And so you might consider that there are various modes, there are various styles that people have in common who maybe speak the same language. And maybe some people here are multilingual. And if you are one of those lucky people, then you understand that on some level, when you want to switch to a different language, it's, really, it's not just switching words like, like in a Google Translate or something, that you're switching senses. You're switching how to see the world. You're switching the, to the way in which the world in this language is versus the way in which language is in a different way in the world that comes with it. That's spoken language. That's something that you really can't have an effect on, it affects you. You're born into it, you're raised into it, and that's your native language. Speaking language is something different. Speaking language, the language which creates itself in its expressive acts, which sweeps me on from the science toward meaning. And these are both taken from a, a work of his called The Prose of the World. Speaking language is where we can begin to take hold of our style and create it, create additional depth to our current style or even switch styles. So relative to language, this is where one maybe becomes playful with language, uses terms in new ways, says things in certain ways with certain inflections to the point where one's style begins to really show itself, to seep out, and then hone itself, refine itself. So maybe you have a certain expression for something that most people don't have, and if your friends happen to hear it, they know it's you saying it or they understand that, okay, this person has met my friend, something along these lines. We see this in poets a lot too, I believe, when they use imagery and they create neologisms, new words, they create metaphors. They take language and they push it in a new direction, a fresh direction. This kind of language is, is a way for us to, for Merleau-Ponty, grasp our style and live through language in such a way where our style as it comes to be married to certain languages, certain modes, again, of expression or expressivity, defines our being on an individual level and then, of course, collectively, as humans who are expressive. And so, again, the paradox in this case, one's unique style stems from a pre-established impersonal matrix, which one inhabits and with which one fuses. And again, that's, that is that coming to learn a language, a mode of expression. Um, this is just a general linguistic point here, but perhaps it's worth stating that once you learn a language, there's no going back. That that becomes your primary entrance, at least to a very large extent, into, into all of existence. And so it's very fundamental. And so when we speak of a matrix here, we speak of the matrix of possibilities of things that could be articulated, that could be said within, within one's language. And then the creative, the speaking component comes in precisely there. When suddenly you realize, well, there are new ways of saying it. Or there, I could take old expressions and revitalize them, refresh them. And so you further the possibilities. You embody your language, you embody your culture, and thereby take it further and make it your own, make it you. This cultural inheritance becomes the flower bed of creative expression. So, so once you learn how to articulate yourself, once you learn how to speak, once you've learned the institution of, say, the English language, you then can work within it to create new modes of expression, new possibilities. 
and thereby come to further refine, further cultivate your style. Right? Okay, so, all right, let me, let me I'm just going to move quickly here. My um, Achilles heel is time management. Uh, so so here, is, here is Merleau Ponty. Because we are not, excuse me, because we are in the world, we are condemned to meaning, and we cannot do or say anything without its acquiring a name in history. So another way of saying this is that insofar as we are humans, we have language, we have a body, we cannot help but be expressive. It's who we are, it's what we are. It's again, how we are. Everything has meaning. Things have significance. And the extent to which things mean something to us gets reflected through our expressions, bodily, linguistically, naturally, all of these things. So I'm going to try to sum this up for you. So here's the first point ultimately about style. One style is an uncanny admixture of the anonymous and the personal, the inherited and the created. So again, the anonymous being what? Well, it's likened to the inherited. So the anonymous might just be something like, again, your genetic makeup. The inherited might be something like that as well as your culture. Again, you have no choice in something like where you're born, when you're born, to whom you're born, what your native language is, what your culture will be, what genetics that, that, that you inherit. You have no say in that. But all of those things do play a role in, in who you are, in your style, in your expressions, in the way you walk, in the way you talk, things like that in the way you behave in general, with and in, with, in which the world surrounds you. The personal is likened to the creative, to where you take what it is that you've been given, and then you build upon that. You never entirely abandon it, but you are able to, again, enrich it. So maybe ever since you were a child, you, um, oh, I don't know, sat like this when you were tired. Until the day you're, you die, till your 99th year, you might still do this. But on top of just doing that, you might do other things as well. Like, oh, I don't know, cock your head to the side and, and look quizzical. Some things that you develop over time through various stimuli to which you're, you're exposed. And then that goes even further with regards to things like, I suppose, your passions, your hobbies, that which you find to be most meaningful. You learn the matrix of, say, the pentatonic scales, if you want to learn the guitar. And then with learning those fundamental building blocks, you cultivate a style of your own. So when people hear you playing guitar, they say, oh, I know I, that's her playing guitar. That's Keith Richards, something like that. It's, it's unmistakable, it's uniquely you, it's personal. Then we attempt to find our style through, again, engaging in activities that we find to be meaningful. Again, such as an author trying to find her voice, so to speak. So maybe you've heard this before. You're trying to find your voice if you're a writer, um, if you're even a musician, as I said before. You're trying to find your batting stance if you're a baseball player. This, this idea of searching, this idea of understanding that there is something very particular about you, but you're still figuring out how to articulate it. You're still figuring out how it works within the inherited matrix that, that has brought you to, to be where you are right now, that has already colored your existence. And you're trying to deepen that in some way. And again, you attempt to do so precisely because whatever the passion or hobby may be is something you value. And here's, here's a last little example. Actors attempt to learn the style of a character in biopics, including mannerisms, vocal tone, etc. So again, if you have actors playing the roles of famous people, the way they attempt to portray those people, and this goes for even just impressionists who are stand-up comedians, this idea of trying to, well, find one's style, try to embody their very person, their very style, the way they talk, the, their mannerisms, the way they might respond, their countenance, their facial expressions, all of these things, pushing their face so that it looks like it. These are all various ways of grasping one's style, as an actor would. That testifies to the fact, ultimately, that style is, in fact, there. There is something to be grasped, that that uniqueness is very much what life is for us individually. 
Style is lived as an ambiguous exchange of meaning between the individual and the world she inhabits. Okay, th this is where things might become a bit more uh, controversial. Uh, but Merleau-Ponty wants to push it in this direction um, for reasons that I suppose I won't have time to get into. But this unique unification we have with the world is something that cannot really be underemphasized. So when we talk about meanings and exchange and how we find our style uh, amid culture and nature and, and things like that, it's important to realize that through style, the world, through our style, the world gives rise. It, it, it is present in such a way that if you are a certain person with a given style, the world itself reflects that style. And when your style changes, the world itself changes. Your experience therein, it, it, it alters, it, it deviates in a way that you see yourself in the world and the world is a reflection of you and vice versa. Kind of like how you see it with other people. When you see other people, you recognize their styles and you can figure out when they're feeling one way or the other way. Through, again, through their bodily expressions, through their words, through their tone, all of these things. So too, on a, in a very literal way, Merleau-Ponty wants to argue that one style is just, it's indelibly intertwined with existence. Style thus emerges and appears as an expressive gesture, which is an expression of the body's basic capacities to intentionally intertwine with the world. And again, that notion of intentionality, it's, it's, it's very important for phenomenology, which is something that he is a part of, it's a movement. Suffice it to say this, that one's style, one's gestures, one's expression is always an expression of meaning. You can't just give an expression to, to nothing. It's always an expression of something in response to something else. What one finds to be meaningful, what one finds to be worth pursuing, valuable, impactful in the world reflects itself in the life one chooses to lead, in the way in which one chooses to lead it, combined with the way in which one has already learned to simply exist. That which we find meaningful first and foremost. Okay. I'll bring it on home here. The body is our general medium for having a world. And again, this testifies to what I said a moment ago. No style, no existence. It's impossible not to have a style. And one style is, again, at the core of who one is, of how one goes about living, of, of the way in which the world speaks to one. And he wants to really put this into dialogue, that the world speaks to you in a certain way, and it's reflected in your style. And in your style, as you engage with the world, you are speaking back to it. And that is where meaning comes from. Meaning in your life, meaning on an everyday level. So the final paradox of style as a, a, a gestalt, a cohesive structure. I am a psychological and historical structure and have received with existence a manner of existing, a style. So again, one style is who one is, what one is about, and how one is engaging with his or her world. So. We are psychological in some sense. We have an inner, we do have an inner life. We, we feel emotions. We are historical. We are the product of our history, both our personal history, our personal experiences, as well as the culture that, that raises us in which we are reared. All of these kind of universal matrices get progressively more specific till you have you. The fundamental thing to realize is that there is no completely isolated inner life. Insofar as we have this notion of style that is an embodiment that gets drawn out of us by the world and therefore constitutes the world, we have this perpetual engagement with the world such that we're never alone on some level. It's really, it's really a, an interesting way to think about things. So the relationship between oneself and the world is a symbiotic co-constituting one. You're always in dialogue with the world around you, and your particular accent, your particular dialogue, your dialectic, your dialect, all of these things is, is the world, is your world. And the world for you is who you've become. 
I really want to make sure that that point lands, that, that, that wholesomeness, that, that cohesiveness. The world solicits us, again, via our perception. And one's unique overall style reveals one's world and oneself, both back to oneself and outwardly to others in the world. Yeah. So when you're living, even when you're alone, this happens. And perhaps, perhaps I should pause in there for one second. When you're alone, when you're by yourself, nobody's watching you, you know, you feel isolated, your style is still there. The way you are, the way you be when you are alone, that is just, that is you. And that same you goes out into the world when you're in public, when you're in an intimate situation, when you're being kind of exposed, put on display, anything like that. All of those are different manifestations in different contexts of your style, which is uniquely you. And the world brings it out of you in these various situations, beginning first and foremost with one's stimuli, one's sensory experiences, and what one takes to be meaningful, or, or captivating, or beautiful, or funny, things like that. So again, we talk about a sense of humor. I mean, that's yet another example. There are countless examples where your sense of humor suggests something about you, suggests your style in some way, how you comport yourself, how you understand the world, comically in that particular sense. One style is one's existence in a very literal sense, and when one style changes, so does the world. Merleau-Ponty is adamant to say the world is not a fixed place. Experience itself is dynamic and, and it's interactive. Always and always has been. And any attempt to try to abstract from it object qualities, scientific qualities, behaviorist, psychological only qualities, yeah, there might be something to that when you're parsing it out, but those are all secondary. Those are relatively artificial ways of understanding what real existence is and one's place in it, as co-constitutor of it. So there you go, just do you. Style is that by virtue of which human behavior is not just a series of gestures, and I, I, like, I like how he puts this, but a melodic unfolding of a point of view, a distinctive way of being and being with. A distinctive way of how you live, of what living is, of what your being is, and how you are when you're with others, when you're with the world. And as I said before, you're never alone. You're always interacting with the world. And so your style is your distinctive way of living, of existing. You might have things in common with other people because you have something, you have similarities such as maybe you speak the same language. So you use the same words when describing a reaction to similar phenomena but what those phenomena might mean to you in particular based upon your personal history, your past experiences, that's uniquely you and it shows itself in your, in your expressions. Whether you express yourself through writing, through music, through poetry, or even just through fashion, or, or simply by just sitting and looking and paying attention. I mean, it's, it's completely saturated. The way you sleep, Maybe you do things in a certain way and your beloved says, oh, that's so cute, only you do things like that. Yeah, that's, he's right or she's right. And that reflects the way the world speaks to you and how you respond to it within it. All right, I, I sort of went over there. But I think we got 15 minutes left for questions. Um, okay, cool, all right. All right, guys. Questions for any, any sort of comments? Any sort of, uh, has, has anybody here ever thought about style on, on any level? Not necessarily this kind of deeper philosophical way, but just in general, what style is? Y'all lack style? Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think so. I think that's the point where style can be cultivated in some way. 
which is to say that, so, so you have certain possibilities open to you, right? So you're born, I don't know, in, in America in, in the 90s. And so certain things that are happening at that time where you live will influence you. And so in that sense, it, it's already begun to hone your possibilities of, of what you take to be um, chic or stylish, something that you want to become. But within those possibilities, you then make choices for yourself and say, well, this is, I want to pursue style in this way. I want to appear this way to the world. And in appearing that way to the world, it's kind of an acknowledgement of, of here's how I see the world. Here's how I see myself in it. And so I want to further cultivate that. I mean, it's funny because when, when we're teenagers, we're still trying to get an understanding of, of, of why we are a certain way. Maybe we hate certain aspects of ourselves. I hate the way I walk. I hate the way I cough. I hate the way I sneeze, something like that. But it's just, it's, you understand it's part of who you are and there's no avoiding it. But at that point, you then begin to, on the one hand, maybe say, I, wanna, I like the way that person sneezes, for lack of a better example. I'm going to try to sneeze like that person. So that way, my sneeze is, is much, much more palatable for people. And, and that's, a, that's a silly way to put it, but I think the same thing happens with fashion and stuff like that. I think that's why a lot of adolescents, and Merleau-Ponty says as much, he, he was chair of the, of, the, of the child psychology program um, at the Sorbonne for a long time. Well, relatively long time. And, and he notices this kind of thing where when children develop into adolescence, they try to adopt styles, adopt identities, as they search for the ones that they prefer. And then as one develops further, one begins to realize more thoroughly how one feels about the world, in a certain sense, and how others see oneself. And then one begins to take, I guess, one's style into one's own hands. Yeah. Yeah, Mario. Yeah, then you claim that everybody has style. Wouldn't also that mean that free will does exist? If there's such thing as that, then wouldn't free will also exist? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, free will is an interesting concept. It's, um, yeah, Merleau-Ponty and, and guys from the 20th century, they don't like to usually use those terms just because they kind of have this sort of religious connotation. And so it's like free will versus, I don't know, divine foreknowledge or destiny or something like that. They just like to use the word freedom in a very existentialist way. So yeah, that's what's so, and I, I suppose we could sum it up in this way, that's the paradox of style, according to Merleau-Ponty, is that you don't really have complete freedom with regards to your style. I mean, you develop certain habits at a very young age before you can even reflect on them. And then that becomes part of who you are always. And yet, you do reach a certain point where when you begin to learn languages and you begin to understand that there are various hobbies you can explore and, and ways you can present yourself, express yourself, that's when your freedom comes into play. So it's not as though you have complete freedom over who you, who you become, what your style is. But you do certainly have the freedom to cultivate it to a great extent. Yeah. Yeah, please. Um, do you think Ponzi would discourage the uh, self-reflection on your style and mm -hmm. lean more toward an organic creation or... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, his preference. I think, I think for Merleau-Ponty, he would say that uh, on the one hand, you don't want to think too much about it because if you're thinking about it too much, you begin to obsess over it, you begin to kind of lose that connection with it. And again, kind of like the, the example with, uh, before about, um, I mean, say maybe you have a certain way of pronouncing words. Maybe you have like a, a Boston accent or something like that. And, you know, you're aware that you were raised in that situation where that became part of your style. And if you were to focus on that, it might keep you from clearly expressing yourself in other ways because you're constantly focused on maybe not trying to say words that, that bring out that accent and things along those lines. So there's that. But on the other hand, I think one has to focus on it if one wants to be creative in that way. So... Again, you have people who are, who are into, into fashion and they design it, and you have artists and things like that. I mean, it, it was so interesting is that when you, if you ever attend an art class or, or go to art school, the very first thing you learn how to do is replicate the style of previous painters. And once you can imitate them, once you get their style, then you're able to figure out, again, find your own voice, figure out where it is that, that their style ends and yours begins. 
So again, that's, that's this paradoxical aspect of things. You don't want to like murder to dissect, you know, to quote Wordsworth there. But, but at the same time, it, in order to actualize that freedom, it requires some sort of sustained focus. And again, here's the thing. The, the focus isn't necessarily work. Because it's, again, it solicits you, it seduces you on some level to the point where you're interested in music or fashion or, or painting, something like that. It draws you in. It steals your focus in a sense so that it's not forced. It seems like Merleau-Ponty would be against forcing oneself into a certain style without there being any freely chosen desire to do so. Yeah? Well, well if there was no such thing as free will, how would we know if we're actually being forced or not forced? If there's no such thing as free will, how would we know if someone is being forced or not being forced to such a style? How would we know that difference? Yeah, well, that's, that's an interesting question. I'm not so sure that for Merleau-Ponty there is a difference. The, the interesting thing about Merleau-Ponty is that he wants to just collapse all these sort of dichotomies between free, you know, free will versus the determinism or um, object and subject. And you, go, and you go, go right down the list. He's not concerned with black and white distinctions. In fact, he doesn't really believe in them. He thinks that there are these arbitrary distinctions that, that help us understand things at a very scientific level, but it's, it's not how real existence is. It's not what concrete experience is. So I suppose, uh, still, your question is good. I, I suppose that for Merleau-Ponty, it's always a combination of influential factors and then what we freely decide to do with them. But would it be like the, 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 the desire that we really want it? Would it be that we actually fought enough to do it? Yeah. Um, if, if, it's hard to really force desire on somebody. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's... Because if you want something, you want it naturally, spontaneously. And again, style, as he says, is spontaneous. It just kind of happens. But within, within that spontaneity, you can work to cultivate certain habits, certain uh, perspectives, aesthetically speaking, uh, and what have you. So it's always going to be this combination of limitations and possibilities. Maybe that's a better way to look at it. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to say unconscious, but I would, I would say maybe pre-reflective, and again, that's that spontaneity. So, I mean, again, when, uh, when, when the monster under the bed scares you at the age of two, um, you're not really reflecting on how you're reacting. But maybe your parent notices, oh, that's what my son or daughter looks like when he or she gets scared. That's her scared face. Right? It's not anything you had any control over. But then, you know, that's your scared face until you die, basically. That's what it is. That's, that's who you are. That's what you look like when you're afraid. Now, that's pre-reflective. That's not a decision you made. So it's not like, I'm going to decide to go like this every time I'm scared. No, it happens spontaneously for, for any number of reasons. The conscious, the reflective aspect of it comes in when you begin to realize, well, Okay, you accept that that's what I look like when I, when I make my scare face. But there are other aspects of me that I can cultivate, that I can refine further. So maybe it could be something along the lines of, um, I don't know, how well you articulate your thoughts, how well you drive, things like that. Essentially, everything that you interact with is an expression of your style. Again, that ontology of expressivity, the beingness of a human being is one of expression. It's one of style. It's universal that we all have our own style. Here's another paradox. It's, we all have our own style, but each style is unique, but we all have a unique style. Step back and forth. Well, hang on, Any, anybody else? Yeah, please. Uh, so, you're saying that each one of us has like an organic style? Yeah. Uh, so, what if, is it possible for somebody like you said, uh, in terms of like cultivating, like taking somebody else's seed, something like that, yeah. to like constantly compound that over their organic style to like form another one. But to me, wouldn't that be like uh, being inauthentic in some yeah. sort of way? That's a good question. Um, I think on the one level, uh, yes, that that's kind of that's kind of what we do almost is that. 
and I, can, I, I, like, I like your term, inauthentic there. That's, that's kind of what living is on some levels, that you, the, the further you're, you're exposed to various experiences and different styles, some styles will appeal to you and some won't. The ones that will appeal to you, appeal to you because of your already established style in, in a very interesting way. So you build upon that. Now, whether, with regards to authentic and authentic, um, yeah, so, you know, is, is, this, is somebody just being a poser, basically? If he adopts this style and that style, so in seventh grade he is into, like, grunge and skateboards, and then in eighth grade he's, like, something else, and ninth grade something else, you know, where's the real you, so to speak? I think, ultimately, for Merleau-Ponty, none of it is inauthentic. That the way in which a human being is, is such that we try on styles. We could do this. I mean, we have our own innate one, but that is simply a, the ground level. That's a building block upon which we can seek to cultivate more styles that, again, speak to us. And again, we're not going to try to become something that doesn't appeal to us. I think Merle Ponty would argue. And so therefore, any, anything that does appeal to you that you try to adopt, in some way it is authentic. Because you do see something in it. It speaks to you in some way. And of course, if it stops speaking to you, you can, you can drop it on some level, unless you've habituated it to the point where it's become part of your indelible style. Yeah, any, any, yeah back there. <laughs> Sorry, Maria. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, and Merleau-Ponty really wants to stress that, I, I believe, is this idea that yeah, the, the way you express your thoughts, again, through language, is not just a way of expressing it, it's what your thoughts are. And the way you perceive certain things, your sensory perceptions, for Merleau-Ponty, that's the way the world is, as you experience it. And so, judgments you might make on other people, the way you perceive other people, the way you perceive other people perceiving you. Yeah, you're, that's your style of perceiving the way other people perceive you. Somebody else may have a different style, a different way of perceiving the way other people perceive them. And it's all different. And again, what, what, what makes it unique is this combination of the fact that we're humans, that we have bodies, that, that we have genetics, genes, and, and that nature aspect of it coupled with our own personal experiences as we proceed to live throughout our lives. I mean, that's where things combine. That's where a personal identity in this particular way comes from, which is to say one's style. But yeah, one's style is never something that is just there for you to display and other people passively accept it. Style is always a dynamic engagement. It's always a, a back and forth. So how people receive it is part of their style. And it's also the impact of your style, pretty much. Yeah. In a very unified, very cohesive way. Yeah, sir. Do you believe that uh, style can pass like, generation to generation, like fathers and sons, mm. fathers and daughters? Yeah, I, I think Merle Ponty would say yes on some level, is that because, again, when we're children, we learn through imitation. We, you know, we mime those around us. And again, if our, if our parents are the ones who are around us all the time, guardians, whomever, we mimic them on some level. And so yeah, it could be in small ways, like the way you hold a newspaper is just the way your dad holds a newspaper, something like that. Although you hold a pen in a funny way that your dad doesn't. I mean, in a certain sense, it sort of becomes random there. But, but yeah, absolutely. The question then becomes, as you get older, Oh, I hold a newspaper just the way like my dad does, but I don't want to be my dad. I don't, I, I, I'm my own man. I'm going to hold my newspaper differently from now on. And maybe you break the habit, and maybe you don't. Yeah. Once, yeah, you and then, and then Mario, and then Mario. But yes, miss. Uh, death is a style or the way of dying? Death is a style or the way of dying. Oh, okay. I think, I think the way of dying. I mean, yeah, I think for Merleau-Ponty, one's style is, and this is, this is common among existentialists, Merleau-Ponty's notion of style relative to how we live 
is no different relative to how we prepare to die. And that's because, I mean, for him, living is accepting one's death. And so the very fact that as human beings we're aware at a very young age that one day we will die, we're aware of our mortality, and some days we think about it or more about it than others, that is going to impact the way we live. And so one's various styles towards attitudes, if you want to put it that way, towards death, are going to be different based on the individual. But nonetheless, it's not anything we could divorce ourselves from because it's who we are and what we are. And so the way we approach dying will suggest something about our style. We'll do it in our own way. Death, on the other hand, um, is kind of final. So, I mean, we can think about Merleau-Ponty, for example. Like I said, he died 55 years ago yesterday of a sudden stroke. It was very untimely. Um, I doubt he would say, that's my style. <laughs> you see? It's, it's one of those things where, I mean, it's tragic. It, it's especially tragic insofar as he was completing what was going to be his, his, his magnum opus, his greatest work. It's called The Visible and the Invisible. He was just a few pages shy of finishing it when, when he had the stroke. Um, and those last few pages before it goes incomplete is some of the greatest stuff in philosophy as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, it's, it's, it's that notion of when death takes you, it's not like, you know, back to Mario's question, you're, you're free to, to, to decline or maybe go out in your own way, or suppose depending on the nature of that. Again, if it's a sudden aneurysm or stroke or heart attack, that's it. I think so. And, and really pushing it a little bit further, if you die of something like a heart attack, that might suggest something about your style of living. Maybe you clogged your arteries, and that's how you lived. And so his death reflects his style in life, his style towards excessive eating. Yeah, sir. Yeah, so yeah, so how, how influential, how far reaching is one style? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, I, think, I think so. I mean, so again, we have whole movements and things like painting and music that we could say uh, are influenced by Beethoven, are influenced by uh, Picasso. Their styles living on. But, but, you know, aside from those luminaries, I think even on an, on an individual level for all of us, yeah. And so, of course, we have the style genetically speaking. So your son is going to look like you on some level. And so that physical style is going to be there. Maybe the way he expresses himself, his facial features, are going to resemble yours because he looked at your face for like five years before he realized he had one. So there's, there's that kind of thing that lives on. But even the greater, the, the greater impact might be in the way in which one maybe learns something about life from the way, the style that people lived and approached it. So if you had an uncle or something like that to really kind of seize the day, and that's really not you, it nonetheless might impact you in such a way to try to cultivate aspects of your uncle's style and thereby they live on. Yeah, the whole it's education, it's learning in, in a kind of broad sense. Was there was another hand? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's the underlying question here uh, on some level is how does one determine who one is? And, and I think with Merleau-Ponty's notion of style, it's, it's a rather rich and, and, and unique answer. On the one hand, it's you already are who you are. But on the other hand, it, it reminds you of the freedom you have to become what you choose to become. It's, it's this interesting connection here. It's, it's this cohesive aspect of our freedom and what is referred to as facticity. So there are certain aspects that you aren't free to change. There's these limitations. So for example, um, I'm, I'm five foot seven. I can't will myself to grow to be six foot three 
and then and then take on a whole new style. It's just it's 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 a limiting component. But within my facticity, within my my facts of, of who I am, when I was born, stuff like that, I am free to become what we what I will. And and I, I guess this is the the key component of meaning is that what I choose to become, the styles I choose to cultivate, the aspects of myself I choose to repress on some level, stylistically. All of those are expressions of what I take to be meaningful. And what I take to be meaningful, I do so, I take to be meaningful because, again, the world, the world solicits meaning out of me. And a as a creature, I cannot help but be expressive in everything I do. And insofar as I'm expressive, I have a distinct style. Is that, does that help? Okay, Mario. Oh yeah, well, I could, well you, humans have style, right? But humans are of our animals. So would that mean that all the creatures like animals will have a same a style as well? Oh, no, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, and it's kind of related to your notion of free will. I mean, look, the first thing I think of is my own dog. And I'm telling you, my, 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 I would want to say my dog has a style. Like, there, there, are, I, there are ways that he reacts to certain things that I can predict. Um, he has a, a bark that if I'm at the dog park with 40 other dogs, I hear him bark, I know it's him immediately. That's part of what Merlin Batiste would call his style. But I don't know if it goes beyond that. My dog isn't free to cultivate a style, right? So he's not free to choose how his hair, how his fur looks, or um, how he spends, um, I don't know, his money that he doesn't make. Things like that. What, what clothes he wants to wear, things along those lines. Lacking that rational capacity is really a huge limitation on one's freedom. And so he has that, again, he has that style because, again, all living creatures really are expressive. So he does have a style on that organic level, but I'm not so sure it goes anywhere beyond that. He's not free to change his style in any way. He's not free to reflect on his style. He doesn't know what style is. <laughs> yeah. No, but I like that question because I think it, it gets, a, again, it gets at this idea that insofar as you have sensory perception, you are engaged with and in, in the world. And then you express yourself again accordingly. Anything else? All right, y'all. Well, um, yeah, we're about ten minutes over. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, this was fun. Appreciate it.